Please take your seats. Thank you. The Honorable Colin Jordan, Member of Parliament for St. Peter and Minister of Labor and Social Partnership Relations. The other ministers of government, government officials, the principal and the board of management of the Alexandra School, specially invited guests, fellow Barbadians, all persons streaming via online mediums, whether here in Barbados or abroad, and of course, the good people of St. Peter. Good evening, and welcome to the Future Barbados Ideas Forum for Vision 2020 Regathering. My name is Jamila Burgess, and I will be your moderator for this evening. Our guest of honor is, will join us a little later in the program. This is the second Ideas Forum for, of this kind. Our theme, Spitestown, a heritage, arts, and cuisine hub. But what does this mean for Spitestown, for St. Peter, and for future Barbados? Spitestown and St. Peter in general is rich and ripe with historic value and talent just waiting to be molded into a product beneficial for our people and the economy. Home of the island's only marinas, Port St. Charles and Port Ferdinand, home of one of our national parks, Farley Hill National Park, and home to the only wildlife reserve on island, St. Peter is on the front lines of what modern Barbados is and must be. Tourism is St. Peter's, bid is St. Peter's business. From repositioning of the St. Nicholas Abbey with its train ride and signature rum, to the spread of cuisine in Spitestown and throughout the length and breadth of St. Peter, St. Peter is uniquely positioned to be a central plank in the future development of Barbados. Today, St. Peter continues to embrace and maintain some of the oldest and most important aspects of Barbados' economy and culture, evident in the fishing village at St. Men's, farming throughout the interior, and in entities like the Rose Hill Tuck Band. I'm therefore thrilled to be a part of this Ideas Forum as it is of great significance and importance to Barbadians. It is signature Mia Motley, an embracing of all Barbadians, allowing all of us to have a say and bringing the conversation to the people. So tonight, we invite you to share your views your recommendations, ideas, and solutions as we seek to shape our nation and chart a way forward to making this transformative vision a reality. Let's take a look at how heritage, art, and cuisine can be used to stimulate economic rejuvenation. Joining the Honorable Prime Minister as part of our panel is our very own MP, Colin Jordan, and the Honorable Santia Bradshaw will join us momentarily. We also have entertainers Stiffy and Janine White, artist and educator Pete Fratoyan Haynes, Chef Gregory Austin, and businessman Larry Warren of St. Nicholas Abbey. Just a couple of housekeeping matters before we begin in order to give as many people as possible the opportunity to put forward their ideas and share their thoughts with the Prime Minister and the panelists, we would like your ideas to be as brief as possible. From the feedback from the St. Lucie Ideas Forum, those who got the opportunity to put forward their ideas are now positioned to work with various entities to make their ideas a reality. So while it is not our intention to limit your contribution, please be mindful that we want to give as many persons the opportunity to speak. Also, 
Please note that there is to be no eating or drinking in the hall. So let the discussion begin. We now invite our very own Member of Parliament, the Honorable Colin Jordan, to lead the discussion. Good evening, all. Thank you for coming. Welcome to St. Peter. For those of you who are not from St. Peter, for those of you who would love to have been from St. Peter, welcome to all of you. A particularly special welcome to my parliamentary colleagues who are here this evening. I think as we begin the discussion, we ought to place what we're talking about as it relates to St. Peter and its heritage, its cuisine, the arts. We ought to paint a picture of what it is exactly that we are talking about. We are talking about a parish that represented our first large commercial space. We are talking about a place where in the early days, in the 1600s, after the arrival of the English, where, they're, where they set up the hub of their business as it relates to trade in sugar with England. We're talking about the place where they develop, outside of that, a whaling in industry. We're talking about a place where, because of its prominent position, there was need to erect significant defenses to protect the economy that was driving the country, which incidentally was protecting an economy that was serving to build the colonizing country. And so the six or seven forts and batteries became part of the landscape of St. Peter. We are also talking about an era, and it is part of our heritage, whether we view it in a positive light or a negative light. We are talking about an era where, in order to protect the economic interests of those who were in charge of the economy, there was need to develop the signal station infrastructure. And so of the five signal stations that controlled movement and activity across the country, two of them were located in St. Peter, one at Dover Fort and the other at Grenade Hall. And so we are talking about, from its earliest days, a place that became important. I almost said special because I view it as special. But I think if we speak to the reality of the time, important is probably the more correct word rather than special. Important for return on investment where business people of the time were concerned. And so when we speak to heritage, we talk about that economic system that existed, but we also talk about the place that the enslaved people also saw as a center. And so in the 1600s when there was a planned uprising, the one who was to be crowned king of Barbados at the time, an African-born enslaved man called Cuffy, he was to be enthroned in spite some because you enthrone in the capital. And so both from the point of view of those who were the colonizers, as well as from the perspective of those who were the enslaved, St. Peter and Spitestone was the center. And that is the, the, the context within which we speak to the heritage that we in St. Peter embrace so dearly. 
and hold so fondly. It is a mixed heritage. I began earlier by saying there are aspects of the heritage that we may not want to think about as positive and that were not positive, but heritage is something that we can't change. And what St. Peter has sought to do over the years and what St. Peter will continue to do is to embrace the heritage, that which we cannot change, but to learn the lessons that are taught to us by that heritage so that we, we speak about economic activity and we speak to something that I found out in more recent times, conflicts. So there are conflicts between colonizers and the enslaved people, but there are also conflicts within the colonizing class. And something that I found out relatively recently, as I said, was that we almost had 12 parishes in Barbados because there was this struggle between the planters and the merchants because Spike Sound developed as the area where the merchants held sway. And so there was an attempt to divide St. Peter into two. And the eastern part of the parish would have been where the planters held sway and the western would have been where the merchants held sway. We have also in St. Peter what is called the first chapel of ease. And that chapel of ease, the chapels of ease were developed because there were no Suzuki's and Honda's and BMW's and Toyota's. And so movement, even in a small country, would have been difficult. And uh, the state church at the time would have located in various points across the country places where people could more easily get to worship. All Saints was the first chapel of ease. And in that struggle between planters and merchants, All Saints was to become the parish church of that new planter segment of that new parish that would have been the parish where planters held sway. I've said all of that really to indicate or, or to suggest to us that the heritage is rich, but I think more importantly to say to us that there is much that we can learn from the heritage of St. Peter. There's much to learn as it relates to conflict, rivalry, resolution of conflict, economic development, Professor Prasad and Dr. Masco and Mr. <laughs> Mr. Cattle. But there's a lot to learn in terms of economic development. What happened? How, how did those early planters, merchants, seek to build out an economy. What did they do? What linkages did they forge in their quest to build out the economy of the day? And we also learn how people who are oppressed, who are enslaved, how they strategize, how they sought to break the shackles that would have been part of well, the main part of their existence. And uh, so we have slave uprising, well, uprising by enslaved people, as I mentioned. And then we also have the development of the huckster hawker trade, which is an aspect of our culture and our heritage that has continued in pretty good measure until this day. So that on Thursday, well, throughout the week, but particularly on, especially Thursdays, Fridays, on, and Saturdays, you will find quite a lot of hawker and huckster activity. That itinerant vending, moving from home to the center of commerce and attempting to compete with the larger established places of business, places of commerce. And so in St. Peter, commerce was pretty early on not restricted 
to a particular class. Large commerce restricted to that class, but smaller aspects of commerce were adopted by those who had been recently freed from their enslavement. Now, St. Peter, and I, I, I want to say this in, in the context of speaking to heritage, and this is a little bit of an advertisement. We've, we are now five days into our celebration as a, as a parish, and as we have planned and strategized about how we would share heritage with St. Peter, but with the rest of Barbados and with the world, we sought to ensure that the lessons of history are learnt by our younger people. And so in our first activities, whether we spoke to heritage in music, we included young people because we believe that lessons are learnt when lessons are shared. And so we have sought to really push the idea of including our young people as we explore our heritage and as we share our heritage with them and with the wider country. Thank you, Ms. Minister Jordan. On the point of youth and sharing with young people, in Spitestone currently we have the Alma Paris School which is now closed. Can you give me your perspective on maybe making that school in, in keeping with the theme of Spitestone being a heritage arts and, quiz, and cuisine hub of making that school maybe a school of excellence in, in arts and cuisine? Could you share your perspective on something like that? No, you're putting me in a difficult situation. Oh I, I almost, no, no. I, I may have to call the Attorney General to find out what, as a member, the Attorney General <laughs> that he has disavowed me. <laughs> no, uh, the reason why I said that is because I am a member of a cabinet, but I can share my perspective nonetheless, because I am first the member of parliament for the constituency that includes Spike Sung. I think there is merit in designating, as a matter of fact, if I go back to our manifesto and what we've been saying subsequent to coming into office is that we want to establish schools of excellence. That idea is based on an attempt, an attempt that I believe will be successful, an attempt to move our society away from a position where at the age of 11, a person because they have some challenge in writing a composition, some challenge in arithmetic, mathematics, or a challenge in dealing with English language in a written form. So having those challenges is condemned to be a failure. Anybody who has dealt with children know that if at the age of 11, you indicate to a child that you are a failure, then you are setting yourself up. But you're also setting the society up to put a lot of pressure on commissioners of police, attorneys general who have responsibility for the police, law enforcement. Because you, we, we, we then are creating what some people may call a subculture because you have placed young people in positions where the self-concept has been damaged. Now, if we, and we are going the route of schools of excellence, we do that recognizing that young people, but older people as well, all of us in this room have strengths and weaknesses. So I know that my neighbor, Chef Austin, cannot do accounts at least not like me I don't feel so I am absolutely sure that I cannot cook anywhere close to where he is at anywhere close I know that I know that for sure I don't I don't know your skill too much in accounts but I know I can't cook 
Now, to condemn me because I can't cook or to condemn him because he is not an accountant is not appropriate for children or for adults. And so, as we think about the concept of schools of excellence, placing young people in environments that will allow them to maximize their potential in their areas of strength, then I believe that the idea of using Alma Paris, which is a school compound, a place where my mother spent 30 plus years of her teaching life, so I have an emotional attachment to the location in any case, I think there is scope for making that facility a school of excellence in some area of excellence. And I think I would agree with you that since St. Peter has been designated a center for heritage, cuisine, and the arts, that it would be wholly appropriate for the Alma Paris facility to become a school of excellence in the arts. And I think it would, it would do a number of things. We need to bring activity back to Spitestown. And that is one area where we can bring activity to spite. So if we have a campus of 200 students in Spitestown every day for three terms, then we have a lot of activity in the town. And uh, so it, it addresses an issue like that, bring activity back to the town. But it also gives meaning to an idea of creating a town that is a center of excellence in areas that include the arts. If there is actually a campus, a location in the town, in the parish, that is helping young people to develop in the area that the parish is to represent excellence in. Okay, so I really want us to explore the topic of Alma Paris School being a school of excellence in cuisine and arts heritage. So I want to invite on stage Miss Janine White to share her perspective on that topic. Be sure some love as she comes to the stage. Good evening, everybody. And certainly coming from a family of educators, having a mother that is a teacher, all of my godparents and aunts are teachers as well, as well as one of my brothers. It is excellent to have that concept and having Alma Paris revamped into something for that. And certainly in agreement with Minister Jordan, it would be exceptional to have an area other than the three areas of composition, arithmetic and English, but having areas where your, your strength, your specialty can be honed, and then you will excel naturally from there because that is your strength. So certainly a school that will seek to foster the strengths of those children that may not be strongest in or, or English and having a, an outlet for them, certainly. And naturally having a school is going to bring the vendors to the school, is going to bring all of those businesses back because then there is potential because the children, we you know, are big consumers. When I think about the theme, when I think about heritage, when I think about arts, cuisine, I think about fire, I think about energy. What is your perspective on um, Spite Stone becoming that heritage, art, and cuisine hub, of that becoming an actual reality? What do you think would need to happen for that to become a reality? I think first of all, we need to be passionate about the concept. So the passion will have to drive it. And it is good to have the discussions at macro levels. Yes, it's good to start there. But then us as citizens, as in our small communities in St. Peter, we have to be the persons that are also driving this concept and pushing the product along. But certainly to have a hub in St. Peter would be ideal in even helping one of my goddaughters with her homework. You always hear she was learning the four tongues of St. Peter, Oystens, Hobotown, Spike Town, 
of Barbados, rather, and the four towns include Spike Stone, and yet there is not a Spike Stone festival. But all of the other towns have festivals. So why are we such a rich parish, and then we don't have our own celebration of that heritage and arts and cuisine through the celebration of our very own festival? So certainly something like that can be a drawing card. And we always hear St. Peter is a sleepy place, a quaint place, a quiet, a relaxed place. And that is the drawing card for us. It is a place where you can come and learn and be a part of everything that is relaxing and quaint and easygoing, but also a very real learning experience. Even in hearing the minister speak about all those things that I'm sure that some of us may not even know. Yeah. Um, for sure, I know that some children that went to primary school with me could not spell Spike Stone, and we went to school at Roland Edwards. So it is ready to start at the community level to push the significance of Spike Stone and St. Peter, and only then can we really make St. Peter that hub. Okay, great. Yes, please show her some love. I also want to welcome on stage at this time Miss Petra Toyin Haynes. This young lady is well versed in the area of art. I'm going to just let her say a little bit about herself so that you too can get acquainted with some of the good work that he, she has done. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wear many hats and I've been fortunate that my parents encourage my artistic venture or ventures. Um, from the time I could remember, I was quite artistic, especially when I started carving things in my mother's um, mahogany furniture and drawing up the walls and stuff like that. And my parents thought that it was wrong with this child. Um, so quickly they went out and got the materials and tools necessary for me to express what I was doing to the house, destroying it. Um, but that, um, that artistic expression goal is beyond me, is more than myself. My parents taught in Nigeria for eight years and I was conceived in Nigeria and they went um, places like museums and art and sampled the foods and and that is, I would say, is innate in me. I was born to be an artist. Um, I wasn't necessarily thinking of becoming an educator, but again, in the DNA, um, it naturally came. I wasn't thinking, oh, you're going to be like a teacher. You know, you know that concept of our perspective that you have of being educators, especially when you're an artist. Um, or you can't get your work sell, so you're gonna go and do art. But it's, it's bigger than that. Um, I believe in sharing. I learned from the students as well. Um, it's not just about me implementing knowledge, but I also gain knowledge from students. Um, or I see things that I wouldn't have seen if I didn't interact with the young people. Um, when I first left yeah, Sandra School, this is where I really fostered my artistic abilities. I was fortunate to have a great art teacher, Miss Jul Mrs. Jules, Gale Street Jules. She called all of us pumpkins. So I was all constantly in the art room, constantly in the art room. Um, and her being that for me also inspired me to be an art educator. You're also a curator? I curate. Yeah. But, bef yeah, but before I, well, yes. And after I left Alexandra, I was fortunate enough to be 
the gallery attendant at um, Queen's Park Gallery, where I learned about artists and art, how to hang work, how to receive work, um, how to price, how to sell. So that was really a good platform for me to start. And that is something that I want to continue, especially putting on this exhibition. I wanted BCC students to come and have that experience in being in an art gallery. So Petra, the question is this, from your perspective as an artist, educator, curator, art director for film, what do you think we would need to do to make Spite Stone become an art hub? What would we need to do from your perspective? What would we need to change? What would we need to unearth in order to get there? I believe we need to go into the communities. I have experience too as being a youth officer. <laughs> so I did a lot of work in the Spite Stone communities where I developed programs for at-risk youth, um, artistic mainly. Um, I also was camp director at one point and my camp was artistic. So we need to get back into the communities to hone those skills, and really see the youth develop artistically, like Jenny was saying, everyone is not academi academically inclined, and we all learn differently at different pace. Um, growing up, I was always in my sister's shadow because she was a scientist and on the debate team and very vocal and stuff like that, and I was always drawing, or my mother would say daydreaming, and that just wasn't me. So um, I, I'm, I was also encouraged to create, which is very, very important um, in, in any creative person's journey. At this time, I understand that Minister Santia Bradshaw is present with us. I'm just going to invite her Sorry, my apologies. My apologies. Um, I guess at this time then, we can also invite another panelist. Can we have entertainer Stiffy to join us on stage and share his perspective? I also want to acknowledge some students that we have in-house. Um, from the Alexandra School and the Coridge and Paris School. If there are any other students here who wish to come and share their ideas, give their perspective, um, share their concepts, please know that you are free to do so. We will have the time where you can come up and share your contribution. But right now, I want to turn our eyes on Stiffy and hear from him, his perspective, Spite Stone a heritage art and cuisine hub. Hi, right, good evening everybody. Welcome to St. Peter, as you've been invited already. Um, my take on a heritage art and cuisine hub, me being in the industry of entertainment and arts to a, to a certain level, you need some place where you can hone your skills, where you can practice, where you can create, as you say, and that kind of stuff, because only then would you know where your boundaries are, what are your strengths, where you can go with this thing. I was not one of the most academic students at school. I was very fortunate to be exposed to the Royal Hill Tuck Band at a very early age, and that led me to, to, to become fearless to a stage where I would be in front of people on stages and performing and, and learning to love that kind of stuff. That stuff was not taught in the classroom. I, I learned a lot of fundamentals from school, don't get me wrong, but it's only after that. So then, then I, I, I became involved in the community 
to a sense and, and, and the heritage of the, of the land shit. So that led me all around Barbados and learning, meeting people, that kind of stuff. So to say a school, a hub, a place where, where that kind of stuff is, is, is created, I would, I would back that 110% because we need more people of creative minds with imaginations that can bring things to life and not just do the standard book, you know, of, of what was perceived to be there before. We need to grow, we need to invent, we need to create, and we need to share. So, so that's my, my take on it. Great. So, Steph, I want to ask a question. Yes, you, you mentioned the Rose Hill Talk Band, which your yes, uncle leads, and the land ship. Yes, sir. How, because we're talking heritage yes, sir. and the arts, mm -hmm. how, if you can give us something okay. more in terms of how that impacted you. Okay, uh, well, at first I thought it was just walking up. <laughs> that was the exciting part of it. But then, then, when you go to the, the actual landship stages where you actually see other landships and then they plot the mere pole and then you figure out what's going on and then you hear the calls, you know, the dances and then every dance has a different, you know, it has a different place. Every, every sailor has a different part to play in it. So as you go on, then you will learn about those things, about the role that every person plays in this ship. And this ship is like a family. Because you have the engineer, you have the sailors, you have everybody, so it plays a part. If you understand it to that level, then, then you would understand it more of it being like, like heritage wise. So for me, when I found out all of those things surrounding what we were actually doing in the land shit, that's when my, my, my vision opened up then to understanding that this is something more than just jumping up, dancing, and la la la. It, it, it's deeper than that. So. We need to get back to that stage. So that's where I, 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 I came up with that. Before we continue, I'd just like to invite Minister Santia Bradshaw on stage so that she can join the discussion. Please welcome her. Okay, so from what I'm hearing thus far, it seems as what, from what Janine has said, from what Petra has said, and from what you, Stiffy, have said, we really and truly, to get the change and transformation that we are looking for, we need to penetrate the communities. The communities need are, are important, are our greatest asset, and we really and truly need to get to them in order to cause change, or change clearly will never happen. Yes? I, I think... Um, Jamila, the, what I heard coming through, so we got educators, but Steffi spoke to seeing something and not really understanding what it meant, having to learn what it meant. And I think your question initially about going back now to the use of the Alma Paris School, I know that the Minister of Education, Technical and Vocational Training is here with us, so we have just made a decision that Alma Paris is going to, anyway. <laughs> I mean, we I, certainly I would heard. wish. I heard it when I was on the way down. <laughs> and we certainly what, what would wish to have Minister Bradshaw give her us or her take. Yes, on such but what, an I want to, what I want to, to just say to, to kind of tie that up was that a place where these things can be learnt, then I think what Sophie is saying shows the importance of that. There needs to be a place where the things that ordinary people look on and make assumptions about. There are people who need to be given the opportunity to learn what these things mean. Before, I just want to make another plug as St. Peter's MP. One of the last landship docks in Barbados was in St. Peter. The Queen Victoria in Rosal, where Stiffy is from. Where I'm from too. Thank you. I, I just want to, that's part of the heritage. One of the last landship docks in Barbados in St. Peter. Okay. I'm just going to ask businessman Larry Warren from St. Nicholas Abbey to join us on stage. Could we just have Miss White um, go off stage for now? But don't um, get too comfortable. I'm sure we will be bringing right back up to join the discussion to continue. 
Good evening, Mr. Warren. Good evening. You've been here from the start of the discussion. Could you give us your views and share your perspective on what we need to do to make Spice Town a heritage, arts, and cuisine hub? Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, just to give you a little background, my family moved here about 30 years ago from St. James to St. Peter. Um, we live um, in an old home just um, above Six Men's. And I have experienced um, transitions in Spikestown from when um, where Courts is, was a garden in the center of the town. And I've seen, um, I should say I'm a businessman, but actually I'm first of all an architect. And this brings a different perspective to Spikestown. And also, um, I've got very involved in heritage tourism. You know, I'm not a historian, but I understand the meaning of asking people to come to um, a heritage site and give them an uh, uh, in-depth understanding of what we do um, at St. Nicholas. We produce rum, we grind the canes. So it is very meaningful when they come and experience it and take that away. And they go away with a, a real understanding of our culture and what we do. So I think, first of all, we must not be led too much into uh, tourism where we do not in, insert our culture. Like for instance, one of the things that struck me about Spikestown 30 years ago, and it still exists today, is essentially it's a market town. Um, Bridgetown no longer is like as, as significant as that. Um, the produce and, and products were come from the hinterland to the town on a Saturday, and it becomes a meeting point for people and that is something that's been gone on for generations. And we still have it. So these are things that when we're considering um, tourism in, in um, heritage tourism in, in Spikestown, we must remember to not lose track of these things because it makes it much meaningful for the visitor. Whether, you know, whether we embark on a cruise terminal or beaches, I think one of the things that Spikestown has lacked over the years is I've seen so many times people wanting to, to develop it and committees get together, but for some reason they always lose the momentum. And so we have to recognize that we need momentum. We need, we need um, you spoke of passion. Uh, we need uh, the passion but we also have to be very realistic, you know, and we must make sure that what we're doing has traction. Um, things like, for instance, limiting large vehicles going through Spikestown. We have this bypass road so they don't need to, which means right away we can bring back all the overhanging galleries that overhang the roads. Um, and that creates its own kind of, um, its own familiar um, kind of streetscape. So there's, there's a lot that can be done and um, a lot of ideas that can, and I'm happy to discuss them tonight. Um, I kind of stress a little bit more heritage um, architecture uh, because that's my background, um, but I'm quite open to discuss um, art and, and entertainment too. So Larry, as an, as an architect and as one interested in heritage, you spoke just now to the over high balconies. This is an ideas forum. What are you suggesting in terms of what a government could do? What people in the private sector could do to realize that? Well, I think from a planning perspective, Spike Sound is ideal because we already have a bypass road. So, um, you know, in many towns like this, there are deliveries that are made at certain specific times during the, the day, and whether it is, becomes just a, a low intensity traffic or it becomes entirely pedestrian. But for sure, what made Spikestown uh, architecturally and heritage-wise was just like it was in Roebuck Street, 
is the, the verandas, because remember, people lived above. Um, I'm an advocate, and, and I recently did some design work um, on a project that is, um, Ian McNeil is doing in Spice Town. And I've advocated that we must bring the residential aspect back to Spike Town. Because today, just like the market aspect still exists, you can walk through Spike Town at 2 o'clock in the morning and you can feel safe. And that is a lot to be said, you know. Um, many Fridays, my grandchildren play in the Esplanade. Absolutely un, you know, supervised. So all these things are important to, to make it work. Now, what government can do is to try and deal with, a, with the notion that a bus can take off the veranda that's just been built. And the other thing, too, is building the verandas are not expensive. Uh, you, you know, you can have facades with the verandas that would necessarily um, um, promote people then to bring residential above. I mean, for honestly, I mean, Noel Roach's building is a real shame that it is nothing's happened to it. Yeah. And, and we, don't, we don't fully appreciate that this building is falling apart in front of our eyes because the top floors are not waterproof and they're deteriorating. The post office is another one. That definitely needs to, government needs to turn that over to private enterprise and to, and to drive that along. Now these can be perfect um, nucleuses for development. But the one thing that I'm still not certain about is how we get momentum and drive forward to sustain a development. And I'm not sure how that's done because I have not seen it done. A lot of people have tried. I just want to wait in here. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, St. Peter. Um, I think that I share your perspective in terms of revitalizing not just Spike Stone, but I think um, the whole of St. Peter. I think it has to start with us really kind of getting people to appreciate their history and why these things are important and also looking at what tourists are coming to Barbados for. It's no longer about sun, sea and sand, but it's also about experiences. And those experiences can be whether it's a tour being taken to talk about the architecture of Barbados, uh, whether it is enjoying the nightlife and the artists and the music and the way we dance and the way we our cultural experiences are. But it has to start with an education of our people to, to appreciate what we have. Because if we don't appreciate what we have, we're not able to package it and to market it to the rest of the world. Now, I've been fortunate to come up in a rum shop culture, um, and I am a huge proponent. <laughs> oh, that's the owner of Fisherman Pub clapping, yes. And I've had the opportunity to witness tourists coming to Barbados, not just for sun and sea and sand, but also wanting to mix amongst the average Barbadian, play, shoot a game of pool, being able to engage in conversations with locals, being able to share experiences. Um, I remember the first time tourists realized how cheap rum shop drinks were compared to going into the hotel. And the fact that they could get a, a, a bowl, fill it with ice, and be able to share that bowl with other Barbadians putting their hand into the bowl in order to get a rum and coke and buying a bottle of rum off of the, sh off of the shelf with a coke. These are things that we take for granted, but these are things that when they return, they tell the story of being able to be in that environment and share those experiences. And I think we, we are seeing tourism moving more and more in other jurisdictions towards experiences, how to make um, rum cocktails, um, how to walk up, and Stiffy is the grandmaster for that. Okay, um, you know, so these are the things that we have to first, I think, start with an appreciation of self. I think the, the whole regathering vision is intended to stimulate that thought and to, in these forums, be able to get persons to recognize a lot of the things that we have, because I'm sure a lot of people may not be aware who are listening or here of the things that each of our, our parishes have to offer. But this provides us with an opportunity to pause and maybe to recalibrate, think about what it is that we have and how as young entrepreneurs entrepreneurs, young people, old people, how we can start to promote and to reinvest in the very things that make us Barbadian. And as we go parish by parish, I think that is the intention, certainly, of the Prime Minister, to be able to, to get us to refocus our energies as to how to be able to capitalize on the opportunities that are available to us. So we've touched on art, we've touched on heritage, 
I'd like now to get another perspective, so I'm going to invite Chef Gregory Austin to come on stage and share his perspective. Could we have Miss Haynes going back to the crowd, and we will call you back shortly. Chef Gregory Austin, please show him some love as he comes to the stage to share his perspective. Good evening, everyone. Very well to have you join us today. What I would like to do first is actually give an overview of me and where I came from and my background. Then I want to speak to the youth, and then I want to speak on the Spike Stone heritage, um, cuisine, and arts. I started out at um, All Saints. <laughs> My, my primary school, um, 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 then from there, Colgin Parry. <laughs> and then from there, the old hotel school, which is, well, many of you would not know that there was, before Paul Marine, there was an old wooden structure, architecturally, um, you know, poised as well. And um, that is where I actually started my quest to be a chef. And this one is for the youth. I used to give a lot of trouble in secondary school. Yes, well, my nickname was actually Trouble, but let's not get into that one. <laughs> and what had happened is that when I turned 15 and I was going into fifth form, my dad said, I'm going to give you one more chance. And then if you don't adhere, I will wash my hands of you by the time you're 16. You don't get a lot of that now. People bury things and hide things and, you know, but we need that to come back, right? So I went off to Pomerine and my first semester, I was like, hmm, kind of liking this. So then the focus, because you, you were trained in waiter, bar, I did the culinary arts um, program and chefing. But I found that when I got in the kitchen, you know, my curiosity was like, wow, I need to see more of this. I need to try this. I need to try that. We all know PDED. I got in some trouble with him, to be honest. He would say to do it this way, it's structured, it's what we do, da 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 da. I decided I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and even though I did it, my way, there was a scouter who came around. He was looking for a chef for a restaurant on the West Coast. And he was like, okay, the others are all structured, but this guy is a little, you know, he's a little wild, he's a bit out there. I want this guy to come and work at my restaurant. So there you go. I went as a young chef, 17 years old, and that's where it started. They gave me an opportunity to travel. I went off to London. And when I got that exposure, I was like, wow, I need some more of this. I'm 48 years old in a few weeks. And then half of my life I've been traveling so I can see what works, what doesn't. Um, I've been through pain. I've been through, you know, you wouldn't believe what I've been through. That's molded me to who I am at this stage. And this is again towards the youth as well, because this type of forum I didn't have when I was your age. Absorb it, listen, be focused, do we, don't waste time. I wasted a lot of time, trust me. Where you are now, I left school with maybe one or two CXCs, honestly. And then I had to catch back up do more studying, wasting time, wasting money, when I could have been doing something else. Um, so that's that aspect of it that I wanted to share with all of you, and I hope it's beneficial. <laughs> Next would be my travels. I've been through Europe as a young chef. I've been through the Caribbean from Puerto Rico all the way to Guyana, working in different restaurants, and there's a vision that I've always had, that I've always had of Spikestown. As a youngster, 
I used to go to the Big Wheel. I used to go to Elmer's and get the burgers. You know, I mean, I know, I know a lot of you. Every weekend, it's like, Mom, are we going down to, you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, then you get those ice cream that swirls with the cake as well, that the nuns used to do. A lot of you would not know of that, but that is where it all started. I can actually reproduce the Elmer's burger as we speak. Yes. That flavor, that taste, I can actually do it. I've been working on it for a long time, so I'm going to pattern it too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Right. But moving on, on a serious note, um, travel through the Caribbean. I've seen places that started out, especially on the beach, very similar to the, the beach on Spikestown. And what they did, all involved came together. I lived in St. Kitts for seven years, St. Kitts and Nevis, rustic, old town, you know, things happening here and there. But if you see St. Kitts and Nevis now, you would not believe it. There's a peninsula in St. Kitts that was just a rocky, there were monkeys, there were donkeys, there were trails and nothing else. As we speak, that is a tourism destination that most people would love to go. So yacht in Mecca, you can go into the mountains, there's ecotourism, there's this, there's that. So there's a whole combination of things that you can actually do. St. Peter, not only Spikestown, could also be something very similar. You have the beach, you have the inland, where you are as well. You have the flatlands, where I see a lot in Ebuff and um, Pleasant Hall and all those places. I see they're growing a lot of sweet potato, there's a lot of um, cassavas going up as well. There's corn, there's this and that. And the hawkers and spite stone spread across the street. You know, this is what the tourists love. I've been in the field for a while, and I've always come back to St. Peter. I've had opportunities to do businesses in other parts of Barbados. I've done as well in St. Kitts and other places. And St. Peter pulled me back to it. This has to be something that pulled me back here, right? And I want to help develop it. I want, you know, through and take it to the next level because it's not only us up here. It's the hawkers on the street. It's the people that are playing their small businesses that I want to see, you know, make some money as well. You have the beach being taken up. You know, I am very passionate about that. I want the locals to get a part of that as well, right? Um, <laughs> I've seen now that it's all blocked off. You know, just one little window now, you know, of opportunity. And I want to see the people on this On, on the highway, being able to, you know, play the trade on the lower end, where I would say, and I like the aspect of, uh, I'm not sure if the battery is getting dead or something, but um, to play the trade, close off the street, maybe, you know, once or two days a, um, um, a month, where you can say, invite the tourists down, right? Spread the street with all the culture, the food, and the art, from Alexandra School all the way to Sand Street. I see Mr. Armstrong, right? And I love what he's doing. He's always painting his place and refreshing it, et cetera, et cetera. I see no other people doing it. They're keeping the same old, you know, just change the windows, paint it up. I know what I like about Bonaire and Curacao and those places, when you visit, and you come in on the boat, there's a line of beautiful turquoise, red, purple colors on the beach. And it's like, it's, it's inviting. You want to like, okay, you know, you want to get off the boat, you want to go, you want to see what's happening. If you come in on the boat there now, the only bright light you see is the nice, beautiful colors that Mr. Armstrong, you know, put on his fisherman's pub. Other than that, you know, it's everybody doing their own little thing. It's everybody doing this. You need to come together and do what we need to do. It's time. We're wasting time. We're wasting time. We're losing money. You know, I, 
I can't fathom it because I come from, you know, I do, I'm more of an entrepreneur and, uh, and also a chef right now. So I see things different. I'm on the other side. I'm not only a cook or a chef or this. I see the potential, which is being lost month after month, year after year. You know, now is the time, come together, sit, make this thing happen, paint the streets, beautiful colors, invite people. I mean, make, it's, it's so easy. I've seen it through the Caribbean and it's working for them. Pardon? Well, you can speak on that, yeah. One way through the town, um, whatever it needs to be, you know, it, it is so simple. Let's make it happen, you know. But Chef um, Gregory, if, if yeah, can I ask a question. In, in terms of, you, you've had white and varied experience. Correct. When we talk about heritage from a cuisine perspective, mm -hmm. what do you see as Barbados, maybe generally, but particularly St. Peter? What, what is the heritage in terms, is, is there anything mm -hmm. about St. Peter and its cuisine? Or the North and its cuisine? Because in some of these areas, we can't limit ourselves just to the parish because the North kind of developed together. Yes. Is there anything about the North and its cuisine that is of heritage value, if we may use that term? Yes, please. Six men's, the fisherman area, where all the, you get the fresh lobsters, the, the guys on the, you know, on the side doing, playing their trade. I love that. I used to do a small trade in Spitestone called the Lobster Pot. I got all my lobsters from the guys in the north. I got all my seafood from the people on the fish market here and western. I developed my cuisine around the hawkers outside of my establishment so that I don't have to go up to town or call, you know, a produce manufacturer to get my produce. All of my menu, sweet potato, plantain, fresh herbs, mangoes, this, that, the menu, I created around that. I would never run out of stuff. It's like, you see you're going low, you cross the street, you tell Sonia or the others, give me this cassette, they give it to you, I'll pay you later, not a problem. That is how I created, you know, and it also helped the hawkers. They had to buy it from someone who's playing, you know, doing the um, plantations, etc. So it all came together. The seafood, the, the octopus, the sea cat, the, 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 the beef town. A lot of you may not know where that is. You know, you know what beef town is? Okay, not the, not the town of the cow, for sure. But it's actually uh, a muscle that sticks on the rock and has to be like scales. You can actually eat those as well. These are things that we need to embrace and let you know, the young people know and, and utilize them. You know? Some people may be like, uh, but if I did that for you and put it on the plate to eat, you would not have a clue. You'd be like, oh. <laughs> Gregory, um, yes, I've known please. you for so long. I've known you it's as true. a chef. I've known you on the beach with the dog. I've known you for yes, yes. forever. Um, but one of the things, <laughs> one of the things I, I wanted to just tap into is, you know, your views in terms of the foods mm -hmm. that we um, perhaps are training our young people in the hotel schools to be able to use to put on the tables for our tourists. Right. Because I think there's often a view that the tourists want what they're getting overseas. But I've often found just as you're talking about the fishing village, tourists want the experience of local foods, even if they are um, things that are familiar to them, but being able to utilize what we have. Correct. And um, this, sorry. Before we proceed, mm -hmm. at this time, I'd just like to invite the panelists in the audience at this time, as we await the arrival of the Prime Minister. Yes. Sorry, Minister Bradshaw, I think I would have cut you. Oh, no, no. I, no? I think I'm asking Gregory to just answer, you know, okay. what his thoughts are. Can we do more in terms of hotel schools so yes, young people yes. to understand what they need to do? Well, on the one of my portfolios, I actually teach classes at the hotel school as well. I, I assist there in my spare time, you know, international cuisine. But what I focus on even though it's called international cuisine, we can still use our local produce, twist it, and make it happen. I can give a very, you know, a simple example. There's um, our breadfruits. 
right? Which we love so much. You can actually use the breadfruit. There's something called crab cakes, which everyone, you know, you go to the restaurant here, oh, these crab cakes are lovely, blah, blah, blah. You can do the same thing with breadfruit and lobster. You can do the same thing with the cassavas and the sweet potatoes, the corns that we get here as well, um, the fresh herbs, the spices, and make creative elements, which when you see it, you would think, wow, it's appealing, it's local, and you know, it's part of our heritage as well. Something similar as the pigtail, which people, you know, flock to. When I was in London working, one of the top restaurants, and believe what I tell you, hear this carefully, 